Hello, and thank you for listening. My name is Karim Sultan, and I'm a curator for the KLF. I'll be briefly discussing an exhibition currently on display at the B709 Art Station by the artist Ali Tnanni, entitled Ce vide, voilà ma réponse. And apologies for my French pronunciation. Or in English, The Void is My Answer. This exhibition features an audiovisual installation and a series of drawings by the artist produced between 2020 and this year, 2022. I'll be talking through some of the works and, and primarily the ideas that I feel tie the exhibition together. Born in 1982, Ali Tnani is a visual artist based in Tunis. Key terms that the artist uses and often describe his practice um, and that circle around what he does are trace, space, and data. However, although these are certainly important terms and can be explored quite deeply, here I'll be focusing mainly on an important idea that I feel the exhibition introduces, and that idea is time. Before we get into it, let's take a moment to describe the exhibition itself. The gallery space at B709 is now a darkened space, with walls seemingly suspended and placed in angular perimeters upon which a selection of delicate graphite on paper drawings are placed. Similarly, two projections can be seen in the space and provide a visual counterpoint to the sparse drawings. This audiovisual work, entitled 1996, We Have Already Destroyed It, is divided in two, with each part partially visible and obscured by the other. The whole evokes a quiet, meditative space, which serves to heighten your receptivity to the works themselves, which require thoughtful looking and listening. To give some cues as to how we can begin to engage with these works, Let's get back to the idea of time. To introduce this idea, let's first conduct a short thought experiment. Imagine you're looking at something, a drawing or another work of art. It doesn't matter what the drawing is now, but just picture yourself in this state. You're in a building, in some kind of structure, whether it's a gallery or your room, wherever really, as long as you're inside a building. Now. Gradually, imagine the speed of the passing of time increasing, where the sense of each passing second is now a minute. Things are going quickly. Then, for each second that passes, uh, an hour. Gradually increase the sense so that a day passes for each felt second. The sun's rise and fall as the earth spins begins to happen so quickly that it nearly becomes a straight, brightly lit line in the sky. The, the passing of day and night now a flicker, almost like the in-between borders of a projected reel of film. Now at this point, each second that you feel pass is a year. Things have gotten that quick. It might be a bit morbid to think this, but within minutes, your very physical body will simply cease to be. The seasons pass so quickly that they're like the pulse of the earth as its axis dances and wobbles back and forth. In this time scale, far beyond human comprehension, let's see what lasts. The drawing or painting or uh, other work of art that you were looking at will now have likely deteriorated. The streets and the area around you will change and new things will be built or taken down. You might see the land itself begin to shift at this speed. Rivers will change course, the sea might encroach onto the land, and the land itself might change, might dry out, perhaps. But the building that you're in, if all goes well, even if it does become devoid of human life, will remain, at least for a while. Now, let's go back to our human sense of scale, which should be a relief, I think. Each second is now a second, each minute a minute. But now that we've indulged ourselves in a bit of temporal reverie, we may be a bit more prepared to now look at and think through some of the ideas that I feel Ali Tnenni's work brings up. 
with this sort of sense in mind, when we see the work, 1996, we have already destroyed it. We are confronted with long, deliberate shots of the Adir Primary School, which is the central focus of this work and of the exhibition as a whole. The light in this work gradually shifts from shot to shot, featuring different times of day and different seasons in the year. For me, I almost feel there is a pulling sensation when viewing this work, as though I'm being pulled from the minute-to-minute -minute scale of time that we inhabit as human beings to something else. The school itself, now long abandoned, is no longer the structure of utility, but through this kind of deliberate looking and uh, seeing and recording and representation, it becomes a protagonist. And by tuning our sense of time to what we might call perhaps architectural time, we can begin to hear what this protagonist has to say. As a counterpoint to this, this work is interspersed with human speech. And that speech belongs to two generations of people closely linked to this school. The testimonials of long-term school workers, Abdul Hamid, Saliha, and Esya Fadlawi. These were recorded through conversations with the artist, containing memories and numerous details from a decades-long life of caring for the institution and witnessing generations of students passing through. This human dimension brings together an audible, but not visible, collection of memories of those who've lived at this school, together with the inaudible memories of its walls and spaces, which can only be sensed through long, deliberate, and sensitive engagement. Now, if you'll indulge me, let's do another thought experiment. We often take our senses as a given. Indeed, much of our ability to experience the world is so centered in our, our bodies, in our very humanness, that we often take for granted that those other than us humans may see or experience things very differently. But imagine, what if we were a machine? How would a machine look at something? We get the sense of defamiliarized gaze when we look at objects from the distant past and try to make sense of them. Yet those objects belong to other humans, not too different from ourselves, in fact. But what if a machine were to look at these structures, objects and views that make up our everyday life? Another clue that we can find in our own human activity might be the highly abstract visuals of technical or architectural drawing, or the diagrams of machines, or plans for cities or infrastructures. Maps have an aspect of this too, that of reducing a complex thing to a simple set of lines and points so that we can begin to make sense of it. Let's take a moment to look around at something around us. Perhaps it's the cup you might be drinking from, or something on a desk or other surface. Or just look outside for a moment and pick out an object, a parked car or a nearby building. If we had no point of reference to what that object was, how would we begin to represent it? How would we be able to determine that object from what we consider the foreground or the background? Would you begin at the edges? Or... But then we ask ourselves, what constitutes an edge? Would we look at the gradations and separations of color? And then we would ask ourselves, what is color for a non-human? A strict set of rules would need to be developed to discern each element from the rest in order to define it, locate it in the visual field, and record it. A sort of machine vision becomes the result of this process, which has been programmed by your various limitations and rules in order to identify and see a specific thing. Now imagine, what if this sort of process took place long after human beings were gone? What would be remembered? We can now return, <laughs> thankfully, to our existing senses. But this leaves us an impression of what it means to see things beyond the human gaze. For me, this is an idea that emerges when looking at the drawings of Ali Tnani.
In a conversation with the artist earlier this year, he mentioned that in producing these drawings, there's a strict set of what he terms protocols, ways of seeing, manipulating, and reproducing images of various settings and encompass what these protocols might be. The most banal locations, like those in our thought experiment just now, become difficult sites of thinking through what seeing actually is. And the ghostly and austere results of this artist process and the context of all this gives us another sense beyond the confines of our own time and our own way of experiencing the world. One of the works, Before the Sun, the Sky Has Fallen, gives us an idea of what this could mean. Comprised of graphite and pigment on paper, the entire visual field of the work is filled with delicate, vertical lines. For me, this immediately gives it a kind of machinic quality, as though the image was the product of a process of scanning the environment and printing an image. In fact, um, this kind of work is the, the product of a painstaking and laborious work, uh, a process of the very human hand of the artist himself. A desolate sense of space is given through the traces of these lines, giving a hint of implied perspective. There is certainly something of architectural drawing in this for me, but not of a verifiable place, instead of something long lost. Other works from the series, uh, before we sail off to the WWW, continue this mode. We see here traces of a horizon, for example, a wall, or the delineation of a wall. Yet the appearance of cloud-like forms seem like digital artifacts and render these forms placeless. Indeed, the name of the series itself and the audiovisual work gives us clues as to the underlying narrative of these works and of the exhibition as a whole. The school, the Adir Primary School, which is the central focus of this exhibition, was built around the year 1970. It's like a machine built in another era, and an era of a modern independent state whose aim with education was the production of a new citizenry. But external pressures and the development of new things like the internet, for example, a connection to the outside world, became both a promise and a subterfuge. The promises of the year 1996, when the internet became available in Tunisia, were broken by both its severe limitation as well as its incomplete implementation in this school. What was supposed to be a kind of augmentation to bring the school into the future inevitably became a botched operation that led to its abandonment and demise. However, through careful listening, looking, and through these kinds of imaginative experiments, we can begin to listen to what was lost. Curiously, although the school has been left abandoned, works such as these make us realize that although they're no longer in use, they will still somehow outlive us. What memories do they contain and what will they tell the future? A future in which we, you and I, are long gone.